Okay, I want to say good afternoon to everyone who's joined us. We've got more people joining all the time by the looks of the participant list, so that's really good. And good evening uh, if you're joining us from Asia, Southeast Asia. Uh, this is the second webinar of today. Uh, we've got more people booked in for this one. The way it's going to work is we have a presentation and that's going to take around about an hour. We're going to highlight a number of university options in there from different places, the UK, the Mediterranean and Central Europe. There is going to be plenty of time to ask questions. So you will notice that there is a Q&A feature as part of the webinar. What I ask you to do is if you've got a question, just type it into the Q&A feature. When it comes to the end of the presentation, then what we'll do is I will read out every single question and then answer that question for the purposes of everyone else who couldn't see that particular question, but also so anyone watching the recording of this will be able to get answers to some of those questions that you guys have posed. I find that the vast majority of the time, if you have a question, then someone else will have that question in their own mind as well. So uh, that means everyone can have their questions answered appropriately. In about an hour, one of our students, who's a student from Hong Kong at Charles University First Faculty of Medicine in Prague, he's currently a fifth year student, he'll be joining us and we'll have the chance to ask him some questions as well. And I think it's going to be very good for you guys to get that experience or perceived experience from a student who's gone through a full five years of medical school in Europe. Okay, so... Uh, we do have the chat feature as well. Some people have asked questions in the chat, chat feature before now, but it's best if we can keep them in the Q&A section so we can go through everything uh, one at a time. So what we're going to do now is we're going to share the screen and in doing so, you'll be able to see the presentation that we've got for today. Following that, we will be looking at the website as well. So there'll be some information which I'll show you on the website. But for the moment, let me get the share screen started so we can go through the presentation that we've got for you this afternoon. Okay. Right, so as I said, this presentation's going to last around about 45 minutes to an hour or so. Uh, it's going to be separated into separate sections. One is going to look more generally at the work that we do. Then it's going to move on to looking at some of the data around studying medicine. Following that, we're going to look at the universities and go through a number of university options, identifying some of the similarities and differences so we can perhaps help you come to some conclusions really about which universities would be the best fit. Before we move on, there are some comments I just noticed. So what we'll do is we'll quickly look at those because they might enable us to actually feed into the actual presentation. Okay. Okay. Someone's asked about the recording. Yes, we are recording it and it is going to go onto our YouTube channel and I'll provide details to that at the end as well. Good. So, right, uh, then we'll look at university options and then you'll transition to university and then there'll be plenty of time for questions at the end that you can ask me and also Aaron, who's one of our Hong Kong based students out in Prague at the moment. So, Medical Doorway is here predominantly to listen to you and to help you find the right fit. Now, there are various things that we need to ask you in that process to try and help you find the right right option, okay? We are gonna to listen to you predominantly, but then also your priorities, and those priorities can be quite specific or they may be very generic with the different university options that are out there. But ultimately we are here not to get you just into medical school, but to help you get through that program and graduate by finding the right university for you. So we really need to think about your aspirations about where you want your career to go. And that could even mean parts of the world that you envisage working in after you graduate. We'll discuss the different opportunities and challenges so you're fully informed about those university options and what it's going to entail both to get in and to study at university. And that will lead us to actually draw up a list of universities if in fact studying medicine in Europe is the right option for you and it's not the right option for a number of people for many different reasons. Once we have identified the right universities we are here to fully guide you through the application selection process and under normal circumstances be with you on arrival at your university in Europe or the UK. 
So our job is to arrange your application and where universities have entrance exams, we will conduct those entrance exams. At the moment, we have confirmed entrance exams taking place in the United Kingdom, where we're based, Hong Kong, and also in the United States in 2021 as well. A word of note at this moment in time, we are planning for the exams to happen in person as we would do normally. This year that didn't happen, obviously. We ran the exams online, but there will be the opportunity should the COVID-19 situation continue into next year that we will move the in-person exams to an online format. It's always easier to move from in-person to online than the other way around. So we're planning the exams as if they're happening in person with the option to switch to online should that be required uh, because of external factors. Our job is then to help you prepare for those exams in terms of exam technique, but also in terms of content preparation. I'll talk briefly about that later on in the, pre in, in the uh, presentation that we're doing now. Then arrange all the required paperwork, not just for your application, but also for your acceptance and enrollment and visa applications, et cetera. And then, as I said, we're gonna be with you all the way through to your enrollment so that the things that you've got to focus on are getting through the exams, getting enrolled at the university and starting your studies in medical school. So here's where I kind of give you some information. Now, I'm assuming that most of you, if you were considering applying to the UK, would be applying as international students. So the data I've got here is taken from our system called UCAS which is our central application system for UK programs. And it's a really good source of information to show you how many people are applying to medicine in the UK. And we can use that data to kind of extrapolate how much competition you've got when applying to medicine more generally. So this is the last nine years data, and we'll go up to go straight to the one side of the presentation for 2020, because this is the most up-to-date data out. You'll see a trend at the bottom. Uh, although there was a dip in 2017, 2016, you will notice that as of 2020, there's a record number of applicants to medical programs in the United Kingdom, uh, 23,710 in total. Now, the numbers I want you to look at on this, if you're an international student, is the number just above that, the 3,530. So that's the total number of non-EU, so international students based on the current data, who are applying to medical programmes in the UK. Now in the UK there are a small number of programmes which are specifically for international students, but the vast majority of students from outside the EU applying as international students are applying to universities that also admit UK or domestic students, and as a result you will take up a very small number of seats above those places that are reserved for people with home fee status. Uh, if, we, if we extrapolate that, there's probably going to be around 10 to 15 uh, applicants per place for those seats available for non-EU students. Now, how is that going to change next year? Well, we've actually seen in that data an increase anyway from 2,700, so nearly 1,000 more applications compared to nine years ago per year for roughly the same number of seats. In addition, uh, next year, and as a note at the bottom, because under current, uh, the current situation is that EU applicants will become international for 2021, following the UK's departure from the European Union and the end of the transition period, which is happening at the end of December this year. This potentially would mean that that 1,680 that you see above that figure for non-EU will simply become another 50% uh, number of applications on top of the existing non-EU applicants. There's a word of caution in assuming that, however, I do not, do not envisage those, all of those EU students applying to the UK full in the knowledge that they will be pay, uh, having to pay international fees in the UK. There are many options that European students can, can take which are significantly cheaper than doing that. So I'm certainly not, uh, I'm not of the opinion that the full 1,680 applicants that were EU this year will be applying next year en masse as international. But there still certainly will be an increase because a proportion of those students will still be applying and it's simply more applicants on top. So really for you being international students, if you're based outside of the UK or live outside of the UK or don't qualify for home fee status, we do need to look at what other possibilities are there for you to help you get into medical school and start your career. 
But the take home message is you can get access to all, all of these programs that we're going to talk and many more and study on the program you really want and get the career that you've aspired to for quite some, some time. All of the programs we're going to talk about today are globally recognized where there are exceptions and there are one or two uh, exceptions which are quite niche to be honest we will discuss them as we go through but uh, for the vast majority of programs you can take them and work anywhere in the world you will develop a whole new set of communication skills by studying medicine abroad uh, that will be because all of the students you'll be studying with are international students so if we take the programs in central europe they do not mix you with the domestic students in the same way that you would be if you studied medicine at a civic university in the UK. So uh, let's take Charles University as an example. They have a program in Czech for the local students and a program in English for the international students. And they call those programs parallels because they're identical apart from the pro uh, language in which they're taught in. That basically means that on your program, you will be surrounded by international students from all over the world who will then become your friends and future colleagues in medicine and dentistry, etc. for the re remainder of your career. If you're uh, concerned about financing your degree, we will go into all the tuition fees, but studying medicine in Europe is much cheaper than the UK in terms of fees and living costs. We are going to discuss a UK option, or I would say two UK options on this presentation. So we will have some comparisons when we get to picking apart the different university programs that are available. In terms of employability, it doesn't really matter where you go in the world, doctors are in demand. There's a huge shortfall of trained doctors in the UK. Most of our UK students who go and study medicine overseas ha have a job offer often even before they've qualified as a, as a doctor. But there's an increasing demand for doctors in all the developed economies, and that's only been going up over the years, even before uh, we were the situation that we've, uh, as we've been given with COVID. So the diseases of civilization and aging population are putting more stresses on healthcare services all across the world. And there's an increased demand for qualified physicians with very little expansion in medical training to meet that particular demand on, in domestic settings. Studying abroad changes you as a person. It changes you in many ways, but we're not talking about doing a study abroad program or even a three-year degree. Medicine is a six-year degree. So if you enter at 18, you'll be graduating in your mid-20s, dentistry being five years. Uh, this does require a, a particular focus really on what you really want because also medical studies are not easy. It doesn't matter where you go and study medicine, it is going to be a tough program. Uh, you're going to have a lot of hours, a lot of content, a lot of face-to-face -face contact, also a lot of deadlines to hit. So this is really only something to do if you really want to have that career. It is financially cheaper, but you're not going to get significant access to financial aid or any kind of, kind of scholarships. Where scholarships are available, they're usually in the way of modest fee discounts, and I'm going to mention a few when we go through the universities. But even with those scholarships, there will be other programs which are cheaper uh, even when the programs with scholarships reduce that uh, fee. You will have to get, way, get, get used to a new way of working uh, in medical education generally. There'll be a lot more team work that you'll be used to, a lot more kind of small lab-based work, problem-oriented learning, etc. But in many countries, the hours that you will actually be studying are significantly different than perhaps you would at school. So be prepared, especially in the clinical years, for some of your lessons to start, start at 6.30, 7.30 in the morning, finishing late at night. But I think if any of you planning for a career in medicine, I think you'd be quite expecting that. All the programmes we're going to talk about today are fully taught and assessed in English. But that doesn't necessarily mean you will be learning the local language. If you go to study on an English language program in a country where the first language is not English, for the first two to three years of that course, you will have lessons on how to speak the local language to get you ready to be at a conversational level with patients in the clinical environment. Now, we've never had any student complain about learning the local language. In fact, students quite quickly find that learning the local language is comparatively easier than studying biophysics or anatomy. Mm -hmm. So where students tend to struggle it is more with the science-based content because it does push you well above A level and above higher level on the IB if that's the curriculum you're taking. Uh, but I put this in challenges, but many students don't see it as a challenge. It becomes one of those factors of studying abroad that enhances their CV once they've graduated and then leave university. 
And don't limit yourself. Many of my students want to go back to their home country after graduation. But after a few years of out studying overseas, many realize there are opportunities all over the world. So I say at this stage, don't limit yourself. Open up the, uh, the different uh, possibilities for you. You're going to meet people from all over the world and you might decide that going to work in Australia, Canada, the US, the UK, across Europe or in the Middle East may actually be better than perhaps going back to your country of origin, wherever that may be. So we're going to talk about the, pr the process you would go through and the process we would go through with you in terms of choosing the right university programme. There are four factors. Uh, some of these are more black and white and some of them are a bit more shade of grey and largely depends on you. The first thing we would focus on is your education, what subjects you're taking at school, whether that's on the IB or A level or any other curriculum that you happen to be taking, and what your predicted output is going to be. When we look at the universities, some do have subject and grade requirements, some don't have subject and grade requirements, but utilise different strategies to select you. Next thing is, what do you personally want from a university? For some students, they want to be at a university that's got a particular world ranking. Now, while that can be useful to identify some programmes, I would say hanging everything on a ranking is not really the right thing to do. Uh, there are many universities and medical faculties out there which are world beating, which would not appear in the rankings, mainly due to algorithm issues that the rankings uh, implement to make their list. So that's where reputation comes in, because there may be programs that don't have a high ranking, but have a fabulous reputation or a fantastic history. So some of the faculties we're going to talk about today are hundreds of years old, while others are more modern with perhaps even more advanced facilities. And the last thing is location. The, the kind of easiest way to break this down is the difference between living in a capital city and living in a small university town. Are you the kind of person that needs to be in a big city where it might take you longer to get to lessons, etc., but there's more going on there and you've got a higher degree of anonymity compared to a smaller university town where you can walk from your flat or student dorms to the medical faculty in 15, 20 minutes. And finally, watch your budget for annual tuition fees and living costs. Uh, you will find that when we start talking about the universities, they're going to range widely. And if you look at the Medical Doorway website, we have programmes as cheap as uh, £3,500 a year or about US dollars all the way up to around about £20,000 or £25,000, dollars Generally, the more prestigious, uh, the higher the, the cost and also location. If you live in a capital city, it will be more expensive. So do consider that when you're looking at location. Generally speaking, where you find a higher tuition fee, you will also coincidentally find a higher living cost as well, because generally the economy is larger. So studying at a faculty in Prague is going to be more expensive than studying at a faculty in a secondary city in the Czech Republic. Uh, both in terms of tuition fees and actual living costs. And we would say, although some of the programmes we're going to talk about today are highly affordable for many students, you still need to consider your cash flow position because you're going to be paying for living costs and tuition fees for five or six years, depending on whether you're studying medicine, dentistry or, or veterinary medicine. The other thing to consider uh, is accreditation and recognition about where you want to take your degree. For example, if you want to work in the UK, the US, Canada, Hong Kong, Australia, all of the programmes we're going to talk about are recognised and uh, enable you to register for licensing exams in those regions and then go on to work as a doctor in those jurisdictions. There are some restrictions around the world, however. One is Singapore. If you're here now on the, on the webinar from Singapore, and you want to go back to Singapore straight after graduation, you need to check the list of programmes on the Singaporean Medical Council website. Uh, that's very critical that you do that. There are routes back to Singapore if you want to go back and you haven't qualified from one of those universities, but that would require you to specialise in another country first and go back with your postgraduate specialisation. In addition, uh, California has a separate list of accreditation as well. So if you want to go and work straight from university in California, we need to qualify from one of the English taught programs on the Medical Board of California list. And I've got some of those highlighted in a few slides from now. 
One other question I get asked is about curricula. Now, for those of you that have applied to UK medical programs and have gone through that whole process of researching programs, you will probably have figured out that the vast majority of programs in the UK are what's called integrated degrees or problem oriented case-based learning types of strategies being used on those programs. They talk about things like spiral curricula, et cetera. Now there are a few programs like that in Europe, but they are extremely rare in comparison to the curriculum I've put up on the screen in front of you now. The vast majority of programs are what we call traditional medical curricula. Basically that means that there's a huge amount of theory front loaded into the first two to two and a half years. So if you look at this curricula here, which is an example from the Czech Republic, if you look in year one, we've got preclinical sciences where subjects like biology, uh, biophysics, anatomy are being studied, continuing that with uh, subjects like biochemistry or physiology, etc. It's only when we get to year three that things start to change. So in the first two years, the focus is learning about the normal body. So rather than learning about problems with the liver or the lungs, we're learning about the normal liver and lungs in those anatomy sections in year one, and then finding out what happens when those organs have problems or become diseased. So while we look at the normal anatomy of the lungs in year one, when it comes to year three, we'll look at the anatomy of the lungs in a patient who's got chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or even look at the liver in someone who's developed liver metastases or hepatitis or psoriasis, et cetera. And then once you've learned that, you can then look at how to assess those problems and then implement management or treatment strategies as a physician for those problems. The culmination of, of your medical studies will be in year six, where you will do the internship. And in this internship, you will rotate around different departments of the clinical environment. And at the end of that, have state exams, which will basically enable you to have a license to practice medicine in that particular country. Now I've got dentistry on the other side. The procedure is the same for dentistry. It's just that it's a five year procedure where the internship and the state exams stretch across year four and year five. So the exact same procedure, just different timeline of things. You will also come into a little bit more clinical sciences a bit earlier than you would in the medical program. So really the one thing I've mentioned briefly before is where do you plan on commencing your career? Regardless of where you study, this is something that you need to think about. Uh, all of you, when you've basically sat these programs will be eligible to take the USMLE steps if you wish to go and work in the United States. And you can start that while you're studying on your program. Most students will take USMLE step one exam after year three or year four of their studies. If you want to come and work in the United Kingdom, even if you qualify from a UK medical school, you will have to take our new medical licensing assessment exams. They're starting from the beginning of 2024. It's been put back from 2021 for various factors, COVID being one. But from 2024, you will be required to take the medical licensing assessment exams to register with the GMC in the UK, even if you go to a British medical school. For those of you that want to go to Canada, You've got the Medical Council of Canada qualifying uh, examinations, which are two exams. Again, a very similar process to the MLA or parts of the US MLE. And you'll find this kind of pattern is repeated in many countries. So if you're a student who's from Hong Kong, the Hong Kong Medical Council has a, a system of three exams, one we in a language exam, which many students can become exempt from as well. So it's important before you uh, when, when we're narrowing down that list, if you have some doubts about whether the program you're going to study enables you to go back to a particular country to work, to check that out in advance, or whether there are any separate procedures that you need to implement before you go in order to come back in six years' time, because some countries require you to inform the medical council before you depart on your medical studies. But once we've done that, we're now ready to formulate the application. Now, for those that have applied through U the UK programs through UCAS, you probably know the system very well. You submit your UCAS application, you submit copies of any qualifications that you've already uh, sat, and also uh, put down subjects that you've not yet completed, whether that be the IB or A-levels. You will obviously have sat UCAT or BMAT, submitted those scores if you already have them, or if you've seen the BMAT about to submit them. Uh, and then you will prepare your personal statement based on the experiences you've had and then submit your application by October the 15th. The procedures for the universities we're going to talk about today, including the British ones, 
are not the same as they would be through UCAS. None of the applications we're going to talk about today are made through UCAS. They're all made through Medical Doorway. And they're all very different. So it's not like there's one application for one university. So some universities will not actually require supporting documentation to support your application. All they need to know is that you're in your final year of school. And then they'll uh, implement an entrance examination, sometimes with an interview, to formulate a decision. There are one or two universities or particular programs which will accept one of the aptitude tests, but you'll find that's extremely rare when we're looking at Europe. Uh, and some universities will require some supporting documentation, including copies of previously studied uh, school qualifications, or if you have graduated from school, a copy of your graduation certificate, should you have one, or perhaps if you're a graduate, a copy of your degree certificate. Other than that, things like personal statements, passports, are the usual kinds of things which you would be expected to submit for some of the universities, but not all. And when we apply to the universities, you'll be very made very aware early on about what paperwork we'll need and when we need it to support your application. So we're going to dig straight into some universities. And as we go through this, we're going to highlight some of the features of each of these universities, including the fees, etc. You can find a full list on the Medical Doorway website and after the presentation I will guide you through the website to figure out uh, for yourself how to actually get through the actual website, make the applications, etc. So we're going to start off in the UK and I mentioned this one now. This has been extremely popular uh, this year. It's been a lot more popular than we expected in, uh, in terms of where we are in the cycle. Uh, Brunel University in London has a program which is only open to international students. So there's another program up at uh, the University of Central Lancashire, which is similar to this, but this one is based in London, with its first enrolment being in September 2021. We've already had around about 30 to 40 applications for this program as of now. So if this is definitely something you want to apply for, my recommendation is to start the application sooner rather than later, because eventually they'll have to close applications once they've hit a certain number. There's no strict deadline at the moment compared to UCAS, but my advice is try and get the application in at the same time if you can. With it being only open to international students, you're not in competition for a, a small number of seats or, or against domestic applicants for this particular programme. Uh, the applications are outside of UCAS through Medical Doorway. So in essence, that means you have in the UK a fifth option to apply to medicine as an international student. Now, for those that don't know where Brunel is, it's actually in Western London in Uxbridge, which is particularly close to Heathrow Airport. So if you're an international student, this is actually an ideal location if you're coming into the UK's main airport or main gateway into the UK. It means you can come in and you're very quickly in your student accommodation or at your university. You're not on the flight path, thankfully, but you'll be far away from the airport. As is the case with most UK programmes, the fees are £40,000 per year. And Brunel is offering 10 scholarships, which are worth a total of £30,000. That would work out at a £6,000 a year tuition fee discount uh, from that £40,000 tuition fee. Only 10 of them. And this is one of the reasons why I'm asking students if they really are interested in this programme to apply early. For those that are taking the IB, at this moment in time, the published uh, requirement is 33 points. Two subjects at the higher level, one of those sciences sorry, two sciences at the higher level. One of those sciences needs to be a six, the other one should be a five, and the third subject at the higher level should be a five as well, or A, A, B on A levels, with two of the A levels being the sciences. That's the standard offer as it is now for conditional. Obviously, if you're in a program which ha or in a country that has a different type of qualification, please do get in touch. We've got a list of all the different qualifications that are accepting the requirements. So if you're taking the US high school diploma, and APs or SATs, et cetera, just get in touch with us and we can send you that information on an individual basis. There's just too much there to put on this one particular slide. But considering that the vast majority of applicants are A-level or IB candidates, I thought I'd just share those criteria with you today. This is a very exciting development. It's an international program in London for students who really want a UK medical degree. And as a result, we are receiving a lot of applications. But let's say, for example, this would be a bit too much for you and you did still want a UK degree. You have the option of studying at Queen Mary University of London, but not at the campus in London, but their own campus in Malta. Malta is a small archipelago of islands in the Mediterranean, just below uh, Sicily. 
this is a British Commonwealth country where English is fluently spoken. And this uh, program is basically fully there in Malta. However, you do have the option of doing an intercalated year in London as well, should you wish to do that. Now, why is this an attractive proposition for students who want a UK degree, but feel that like the UK is a bit priced out of the market for them? You can just see the tuition fee there. The tuition fees for this program are 20,500 euros a year for 2020 entry. We expect a small increase for 2021 admission, so do expect this to go up a bit, but still that roughly represents a 50% saving on studying for the same program in the UK and obviously you get to live in the beautiful Maltese islands as well. This is another option which is outside of UCAS, so we've now on top of your four potential UCAS applications to the UK, you've got two UK programmes which you can get admission to without having to go through UCAS. So we're now up to six UK degree options at this moment in time, one being a 50% saving on studying the equivalent programme in London. The one difference between this programme and the one in Brunel is this programme does require you to have UCAT. The programme in Brunel doesn't require UCAT or BMAT. It's purely based on how you perform on interview plus then what you gain on your IB or A-levels. Another option to consider, which perhaps is even uh, better in terms of fees, would be the University of Nicosia in Cyprus. So at the moment, we've discussed one British programme, a British programme in the Mediterranean, and this is another Mediterranean programme, but this programme is awarded by the University of Nicosia. This is arguably one of the best equipped medical schools in the world, and it definitely has some of the world's best student accommodation. I've never been to many universities that have rooftop infinity pools in their student dorms, certainly not in the UK but the University of Nicosia certainly does. This is open to all applicants. Like with the programme in Malta, it doesn't matter whether you're international or you would be classified as home fees in the UK, you can apply to this particular programme. The fees without a scholarship are €18,000 per year for the first three years, rising to €22,000 per year, years four, five and six. For those that qualify, there is the option of doing clinical placements in the United Kingdom, Alternatively, in your final year, there, are, there is the possibility of doing clinical attachments in the USA as well. The programme has been mapped against the USMLE. So for those of you that are thinking about taking the USMLE, this programme, by, by the time you get to year four, will have really given you a head start in sitting the USMLE step one. Perhaps even if you never have go to work in the US, having the USMLE steps and the certification required to do that is definitely a good thing to have on your CV. Like the other universities, they do base admission on a video interview and then make a conditional offer. That conditional offer is usually an ABB, if you're taking A-levels, or 32 points on the IB with 16 at the higher level. Uh, you will require biology at the higher level or an A-level in biology as well. Now, the faculty does offer scholarships. Uh, the University of Nicosia provides a scholarship of up to 20% fee reduction. And once you've been awarded this scholarship, that then continues for the full six years of the programme. Many of our students who apply for the scholarship receive at least something. They'll receive 5, 10, 15, or even the full 20%, as a number of our students this year did. And they let you pay the fees in eight instalments. So if you feel that the fees are high for you, but you could stretch those fees over eight payments, the University of Nicosia now might be more accessible. Now you'll notice on the picture that there's a the badge of St George's University of London. This university does have a formal tie-up with St George's University of London. There are two degrees taught at the University of Nicosia. One is the six-year programme for school leavers taught by the University of Nicosia and awarded by the University of Nicosia. The other one is a four-year graduate entry programme awarded by St George's University of London, which is a British degree. But the fact that the universities are collaborating on that means there's a greater degree of similarity in the curriculum uh, style in this university to the UK norm. So you'll find more PBL orientated uh, strategies implemented in this university compared to the traditional medical curricula, which you'll find predominant across Europe. So we've, we've highlighted the, some of the main popular options in London and in the Mediterranean. We're now going to move into continental Europe. 
we've had a huge number of inquiries and a lot of applicants from across Asia for our programs in the Czech Republic. So much so that for the last three years, we've run the entrance exams and selection interviews in Hong Kong as a hub for the whole Asian region. And we run them at the moment at King George V ESF School, which is one of the oldest English language uh, secondary schools in Hong Kong. For those that don't know where the Czech Republic is, uh, it's right in the heart of Europe, landlocked country, Germany to the north, Austria to the south, and it is officially one of the safest countries in the world. On the Global Peace Index, this year's Global Peace Index, the Czech Republic ranks eighth safest country in the world. So it's in the same region as Singapore in terms of safety. If we compare that to the UK, the UK is 42nd. So a substantially safer country officially than the UK. Uh, some of the cities in the Czech Republic are stunningly beautiful. If you've never been to Prague before, and you, even if you don't go study there, I would definitely recommend visiting Prague, but also getting out of the city and visiting some of the other fantastic locations in the Czech Republic as well. It's a member of the European Union. So that means that the qualification you gain from here is European Union and European Economic Area recognised automatically. It's also part of what we call the Schengen Passport Free Area. Now, for those of you that know what this is, just bear with me for a minute while I inform those who perhaps don't know. There are a number of states in Europe that share the same immigration policy. So once you enter one country in the Schengen zone, you can travel across the Schengen zone without crossing any more immigration uh, barriers. So if, for example, you're traveling to the Czech Republic, but fly into Schiphol in the Netherlands or Frankfurt in Germany first, you would clear immigration there. And then when you fly onto Prague, you would effectively travel as a internal flight, a domestic flight. So you wouldn't show your passport again, you'd collect your luggage and then leave the airport. This does mean that if you were living in Prague and you wanted to go to Berlin for the weekend, you can jump on a train in Prague, go to Berlin, it takes about four and a half hours on the train, and then you're in there without showing your passport when you cross the border into Germany. You probably wouldn't, the, the first time you'd know you'd cross the border into Germany is when you get a text message on your cell phone. If, however, you were in Brno, in the south of the Czech Republic, the actual nearest capital city is not Prague, the nearest capital city is Vienna. So there's no reason why you can't jump on a train and do a day trip to Vienna. And again, you wouldn't be showing your passport when you cross the border. Czech Republic as a whole has a population of 10 and a half million. So it's a, not a particularly densely populated place compared to the size of the country. And as a result, there's an amazing countryside. You can go skiing at the weekends, things like that. And as a very, as a country that has got a lot of history, there are currently 12 UNESCO heritage sites within the Czech Republic, which is one of the highest in, per capita in the world. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about the five programs on here that are running their entrance exams in Hong Kong, because this webinar is mainly directed for students in the Asian Pacific region. There are more programs in the Czech Republic and across Europe, and I'll show you where they are uh, on the Medical Doorway website when we come to the end of this presentation. Admissions to the Czech Republic is different than the programs we've already discussed. Uh, on the programs we've discussed, you have an interview and you're made a conditional offer if you're still in your final year of high school. Things in the Czech Republic are different. Admission is not based on how you perform at school. You need to graduate from school and therefore have the eligibility to go to university. But a decision on whether you would go to the university is based purely on how you perform on the university entrance exam. Now, some students ask me, is there one exam for the whole of the, the, all of the uni Czech Republic universities? The answer is no. Each faculty, within the Czech Republic is responsible for its own selection and admission. So if you apply to five programs, you will have to take five entrance exams. Now, under normal circumstances, that would obviously require you to travel to Europe multiple times because the exam dates don't necessarily match up with one another. What we do in Hong Kong to make it easier is we run the five exams over a six day block, meaning that you can, don't have to travel all over Europe on multiple occasions to take multiple exams. You can have one journey into a central hub in Asia, Hong Kong in this particular case, and take all of your exams over an intensive block. You will also, after you've taken the exams, usually find out the result on the day of the exam. So in, for some of these faculties, you will walk into the exam room, sit the exam, 
there's a copy of what there's a picture of one of our exams there have the interview which follows up the exam and then be told if you've been admitted or not and it's based on how you perform on the entrance exam and the interview and those two uh, are scored and come together to give you an overall mark and if that mark is above the threshold you will then be made an offer and that is it you are then admitted into medical school from the next enrollment as I said, we are hoping to run the exams in person. We plan to do that, but we have a strategy of being able to switch to online should the COVID uh, pandemic situation continue to require us to do so. All of the exams are multiple choice and they differ from one faculty to the other. They will all involve chemistry and biology. All of them do involve chemistry and biology. Some faculties have a paper that they call physics, which is kind of a blend of physics, applied maths, mechanics, Please don't get scared by the word physics. Everyone seems to get scared by the, uh, by the term physics. It's not as tricky as actually you may think. In fact, we have students who've not taken physics at a higher level who do better in the physics than sometimes they do on the chemistry or the biology. Some faculties give you an option of taking a maths paper instead. And then other faculties will embody that up with an interview, which will then give us that score. Now, we would advise people to prepare in advance for the entrance exams. If you're taking the International Baccalaureate, you will certainly be well prepared based on the passing rates of our exams over the last three years. But definitely get onto our check test prep program, which all of our applicants who've applied and registered for our entrance exams get free access to, because that is specifically mapped against the schedules of these entrance exams. It's not going to replace your high school education. It will then enhance what you already know and perhaps cover up a few gaps there may be in your knowledge in terms of preparing for the entrance exams. So let's go over the five programmes in the Czech Republic that utilise that strategy and are running their exams in Hong Kong. This is by far the most well-known and the most popular medical school. Now, people ask me about Charles University, and my response is, if it was good enough for Einstein, it was good enough for anyone. Charles University uh, First Faculty of Medicine, which is right in the centre of Prague, just a short walk from Wenceslas Square in the, the kind of heart of the tourist area of Prague, is that one of the four founding faculties of Charles University. I'll talk about the structure in a moment when we get on to the next faculty, but it's the 11th oldest medical school in the world and it comes with certain characteristics which are really fantastic when you think about it. As well as being the world's 11th oldest medical school, it's also one of very few English programs which is accredited by the Medical Board of California. This means that if you qualify from Charles University First Faculty of Medicine, you can then commence your residency in California. Also, if you are a US passport holder, this program is US federal loan approved. And we do have students who are on US federal loans studying in uh, First Faculty. They're currently mapping their program to the US MLE as well. So that's to help you prepare for the US MLE exams. And quite certainly, it's one of the one of the European faculties that has a British vice dean. Now, I'm not mentioning this specifically because I believe having a British vice dean is an advantage or not. The reason it is is uh, the vice dean of international, Dr. Eitan Brisman, actually was one of the very first students, British students, who qualified from the English program at Charles University First Faculty of Medicine. He then returned to the UK, where he trained also as a dentist, and he's now a max fax surgeon working at the Royal Free, and now he's relocated back to the Czech Republic with his family, where he now works as the Vice Dean at the First Faculty of Medicine. So here you've actually got a Vice Dean who knows exactly what you as an international medical student are going through while you're on the course, and that can be an advantage. For a university of this prestige, one of the world's highest ranked medical schools, you would expect to pay a significant amount to study here, as you'd expect. But as you can see from the fees, they are extremely affordable compared to options. 15,000 euros a year would work out around a quarter of what you pay or a third of what you'd pay in a British medical school. Both medicine and dentistry are priced at this in this faculty, the difference being dentistry as a five-year program. Now, this is one of the most competitive programs in Europe to get access to. If you're planning for this one, we do advise you to apply early and to start preparing early. You, you can't prepare too early, put it this way. But our, our experience in the Hong Kong exams, regardless of where students have come from for those exams, is we have the highest passing rate in the world on those exams. The international passing rate is around about 10%. So nine out of the 10 students that apply will not receive an offer. Our passing rate in the Hong Kong exams has been up to closer to 50%. Uh, 
uh, mainly because the education system in that part in, in Asia where you are studying is much more rigorous than it is in rigorous than it is in Europe, but also uh, the preparation that we provide does help give you a slight advantage on going forward in this exam. And there's another faculty, Charles University second faculty, and this is where I'm going to answer that question that everyone has about what does this actually mean, first faculty, second faculty. Charles University is like Oxford or Cambridge. It's a rectorate organization. And under this rectorate organization, you've got different colleges that we will simply call faculties. So like in Oxford or Cambridge, you would study at a particular college. In Charles, you would study at a particular faculty. So within Prague, there are actually three faculties of medicine and two faculties of medicine outside of Prague. This is the second faculty, which also ran an exam in Hong Kong. It only has medicine, it doesn't have dentistry. It's smaller than the first faculty, but it's based in a hospital environment. So if you want to be in a clinical environment, it's a great option to consider. Hence the word MOTOL on the badge there. That is the name of this hospital, which you can see a picture of right here. It, in addition, uh, like with first faculty, sorry, it does have Californian accreditation. So you can take your English taught qualification from this faculty straight to California, should you wish to. It's also directly on the Prague Metro. It's got its own dedicated Metro stop. This means that while this faculty is not in the city center, it is more on the outskirts where all the hospitals and things are gonna be. You are able to live in the city center and hop on the underground and 20 minutes be at your uh, faculty. So it doesn't matter that it's outside of the main part of the city. You can still benefit from that inner city life and experience uh, because of the exceptional public transport in Prague and also wider across the country. It does work out cheaper to study here. It's uh, 330,000 Czech Krone a year, which roughly works out about 12,500 euros or 14,500 US dollars. So just mark another saving compared to even first faculty, as well as the universities in the UK. Charles University Faculty of Medicine in Hradec Králové is the final faculty of Charles University we're going to talk about today, but it's not based in Prague. It's in a city 90 minutes east of Prague. And uh, curriculum wise, it's very similar to first faculty. It's about the same size as first faculty. So it's a significantly large medical school. Uh, this picture here is the dedicated medical faculty, but the town is about 100 to 120,000 people. This basically means that uh, you're not going to have to go and get the metro or trams, etc., to your lectures every morning. You can walk from your apartment in the city centre, 10 minute walk to the medical faculty. And if you're going to go to the hospital site from the medical faculty right across the town, it's about a 20 minute walk. What you will benefit from is significant savings in terms of tuition fees and living costs because you're outside of the capital city. So we're now starting to bring fees down to about 11,500 euros a year for medicine or 12,500 euros a year for dentistry. So that's where you can start to see some of the benefits perhaps of not studying at a capital city university if you are trying to manage your finances. We're going to move to a different part of the country now, and this is to make another point. You don't need to stay in a capital city to study at high ranked prestigious university. Palatsky University in the small town of Olomouc is the second oldest medical school in the Czech Republic. It's a bit more modern than Charles first faculty and that it was developed in the 1500s, not the 1300s. But you'll notice that once we start getting further away from the capital city, the tuition fees substantially reduce. Here, we're looking at medicine for less than 100,000 Hong Kong dollars. So about 10 and a half thousand euros to study medicine here, or just under 12,000 euros a year to study dentistry with some amazing facilities, as you can see in this image. Now I've brought this here for a reason because you don't have to go to those big civic, big city universities to have an exceptional education. Uh, Palatsky University was the alma mater of the surgeon who led the USA's first full face transplant, Dr. Bodan Pomat. So he graduated from Palatsky University and then went to Boston, where he's now working at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and also Harvard Medical School. And he uh, pioneered face transplantation in the US, becoming only the third full face transplant formed in the world. So again, you will go to universities that equip you with knowledge and skills to take your career to a very advanced level if that's what you're aiming for. But if you want to go to a university with cutting edge facilities, you can't really beat Masaryk University in Brno. They've got a brand new 40 million euro clinical simulation center, which is 
probably the most best equipped simulation center in the whole of Europe, if not just Central Europe. It's in the second city of Brno, about 300,000 people. It's actually easier to get to Vienna in Austria than it is to Prague. It's actually closer. So, you know, there's no reason why you, if you've got some time off at the weekend, you can do a day trip to Vienna on the train. And here you are looking at uh, about 11,000 euros a year to study uh, medicine or 12,500 euros to study dentistry. We, this is our, our, our most popular program in the Czech Republic because it brings together a high level of academic output with a very competitive tuition fee in a really um, a impressively equipped medical school. There's a, also a clinical research center on site as well. And some of our fourth and fifth year students are actually at this stage already publishing peer reviewed research, which is something that their colleagues in the UK medical schools perhaps haven't had the chance to do yet. So there are certain advantages of going to universities that have these facilities where you, if you show initiative, you can definitely get involved with and benefit from. But you can study at a variety of universities. This is the University of Veterinary and Pharmaceutical Sciences in Brno, where our veterinary students go. And if you go on the Medical Doorway website, you'll see other universities like Pleven Medical University in Bulgaria, Poznan University of Medical Sciences in Poland, which is extremely impressive offer, especially for students who are looking at graduate entry medicine, or even more tropical destinations like Southern Croatia and the University of Rijeka, uh, which is in a beautiful, quiet, sleepy part of the coastline of Croatia. So there are some of the programs. We're going to look at the other programs in a moment on the website before Aaron joins us in about 10 minutes time. Uh, what does it cost to apply? It varies from one place to the other. If you're looking at uh, programs in the Mediterranean, then you're, there are no application fees for Queen Mary University of London's program in Malta. There are, however, for the University of Nicosia, you're looking at about 60 euros uh, application fee once your eligibility is being confirmed. Following that, uh, if you're looking at Brunel in London, again, there's no application fee for there. So an application is 100% free. Where costs do start to come into play is where there are entrance exams, because the universities have an application fee, but there also is an exam fee to cover the cost of hiring the exam center, to cover the cost of the flights and the hotel, et cetera, of the examiners, because we physically bring the examiners to Hong Kong to conduct the exam and do the interviews. However, this will mark a significant saving than you having to travel and live in Europe for countless uh, trips to sit various entrance exams. So rather than you having to make three or four trips, you're able to make one trip to one center, take all the exams and fingers crossed, walk away with your offer. After you are accepted, there will be some legal requirements for you to go through, in, whether in terms of visas, but also translation of documents, et cetera. Uh, we're able to provide full advice and assistance on that, but just bear that in mind, that can cost a few hundred euros to get done in total. Some of the universities, once they've given you an offer, will require a deposit of the tuition fees. It's not additional to, it will be deducted from the tuition fees to hold your seat. Bear in mind, all of the programs we've talked about are oversubscribed. So they need to be fully aware that you will be taking up the seat if you've been made an offer. And the only way they can reliably do that is to charge a small deposit, usually 10 to 20% of the year one fee. But this is definitely a route for you. And we've got hundreds of students that have gone to study medicine in various universities across Europe. And now I'm spending a lot more time usually at graduations than I even am in exams because we've got hundreds of students graduating now as we've been working with these universities for coming up to 10 years. Uh, if you are accepted, you know, under normal circumstances, I would definitely suggest doing a visit, uh, even if it's a social visit in the summer, just to get used to the place you're going to stay in and get used to the surroundings. And if your families want to visit as well, that will help them give re some reassurance as to the environment you're going to be in as a medical student. And if you are going to visit, we can arrange for one of our existing students or a member of staff from the university to welcome you and show you around so you get a feeling of the place that you're going to be in. Uh, perhaps you want to stay in student accommodation or you may actually only want to stay in, uh, in private apartments. Again, we can arrange that for you as well. Uh, we've got colleagues who work in every single place which can help coordinate things. One thing that's required for your visa when you come around to a visa application is health insurance. It's a mandatory requirement for your visa to be issued. If you have health insurance already, that covers you, that'd be great. Alternatively, you can buy health insurance from a local insurance company, usually at a significant discount as well, which will cover you for your visa. 
But here you can see some of our students from uh, now six years ago. So Atta, who is here, and he's in one of our pre-departure briefing videos from uh, 2019. He has graduated just recently as a dentist and is now uh, back in the UK. Abdullah here is a doctor who'll be graduating this next coming year to uh, work as a doctor in the NHS over here in the UK. But these are some of our students at Palatsky University and here's some of our students uh, at Pleven Medical University who'll be graduating the forthcoming year as well. Now, before we bring Aaron online, he should be online very soon. Uh, we want to share with you some of our information on our website so you know if this is the right route for you, where to go to to make your application. You can drop us an email. Uh, my email address is ben at medicaldoorway.com or take a look at our Facebook page. This presentation will be on our YouTube channel as well, but do have a good look at our YouTube channel. There's a lot of information on there from some of our outreach work plus different university videos, etc. Alternatively, go to medicaldoorway.com and take a look at the website. Now, Aaron, our student, is online now. So, Aaron, thank you for joining us. You will be with us in a moment, but what we're going to do is quickly take a look at the website and then, uh, uh, Aaron, we can ask some questions to you. Okay? Right. So, first things first, we're going to go onto the website and just take a look at that. So... Okay, so you'll see this is the Medical Doorway website uh, where you've gone to. All of the universities we've talked about and the other ones that we've perhaps not talked about, we work 19 in total and there just isn't enough time to cover everything, will all be listed under the universities tab. You can either check the drop down list or click to get a full list of them. Here they all are here with their countries and flags. Perhaps, for example, you want more information on the University of Nicosia, you can find that out on the dedicated page where you can put an inquiry through, an informal inquiry, different videos, et cetera. But let's say, for example, you want to make an application. You'll notice on each university page, there's a link to the application form, which are all online, or you can click apply now to bring them all up. Now, if you are applying for the programs in the Czech Republic and you would want to take the entrance exams in Hong Kong, you've got this here. And this is the application form for the Hong Kong programs. You can see the five exams, I should say, you can see the five programs here. All you would do is fill this form in. The 2021 dates will be going online here by the end of this week. You can choose the faculties you want to apply to, but the vast majority of our students coming to Hong Kong take all five. Also, the first faculty of medicine is the final exam. So anyone aiming for that usually just take the other ones as well to help prepare for that exam. Uh, fill that form in, hit submit, and then a member of uh, myself or a member of the Medical Doorway team will be in touch. Alternatively, if you want to look at the exam dates, they'll all be listed on the exam section here. And more are about to appear over the over the coming over this week as we uh, confirm the final lot of exam dates. But if you want to raise an inquiry or even make an application, it can all be done very easily from this really user-friendly website which I've developed for students. So what we're going to do is before we ask the questions, because I can see there are some uh, some questions, what we're going to do is I'm going to go and speak to Aaron online. And I'm, Aaron's going to have a talk to you about his experiences of a student. OK. Uh, promote to panelist. He'll be online again now and fingers crossed we'll see him pretty swiftly. Now, I'll briefly introduce to Aaron. Aaron, here he comes. Aaron uh, was a student. Is your video on, Aaron? Okay, there's his picture. Hello, Ben. Hi, Aaron. Okay, I'm just introducing Aaron. Is your video on at all, or are we videoless? Um, well, there he is. There's Aaron. You see me? Okay, guys, yeah, for those of you that are online, Aaron uh, is a fifth year now. The fifth year, fifth year medical 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 student from Hong Kong, who is actually mm -hmm. studying at Charles University First Faculty of Medicine. And I would say it's probably had one of the most positive experiences because Aaron has done a lot, not just study, but has done a lot of other things, including actually teaching some of the junior students as in the anatomy demonstrator. Aaron, we've currently got about uh, a number of people online. Uh, we have got some questions which we will go through in a moment. Uh, okay. But what I'd like to try and uh, kind of get really is if you were to encapsulate your experience over the last five years, what would you say have been the, the good things, the positive things, and what have perhaps been the challenges you've had to face as a medical student from Hong Kong studying in Prague? 
Yeah, so um, first of all, for a lot of students from international, with an international background, they usually struggle with English. But for most of the people from Hong Kong, I don't think it's a big problem at all. Um, so that is one of the ma major challenge for most of the students. But also, if you want to get into, uh, get through first year, uh, studying anatomy and histology, for example, then you really have to spend a lot of time uh, going through the materials over and over again. Because what mm. practically what happens is um, in class, in practical, in lectures, the professors, they will go through all the materials necessary that for you to know or necessary for the exam. Um, but the understanding ultimately is based upon uh, how much time you actually put in the subject mm. as well. Mm. Um, Aaron, quick one. Why? I think, actually, why did you actually choose, say, the Czech Republic? Because obviously, being from Hong Kong, you had options in Australia or the UK, parts which have historically been linked to Hong Kong, perhaps closer than the Czech Republic. But why for you? Why Prague, as opposed to London or, uh, or for example, uh, Perth? Yeah, that's a very, very good question. Actually, at the beginning, I was actually struggling where exactly which medical school am I supposed to choose. Uh, to pursue medicine and ultimately become a doctor in the, in the future. But coming from a middle class um, in Hong Kong, um, you know, studying in Prague actually provides me a really, really competitive tuition fee. Mm. And also, um, according to some of the, uh, like, you know, some of the conversation I, I've had with some of the Czech students I met in UK, um, they all suggest me to uh, go to Czech Republic. Mm. They all agree that Czech Republic, they provide you know, universities in, in general. Mm. They provide yeah. you a really, really good uh, quality of, of mm. teaching. And um, the main thing is the, the price is really complex coming yeah. from yeah. the class. And you, know, you do get to live in one of the most beautiful capital cities in, in, in the whole of Europe. Exactly. Europe. I, I, I have plenty of time Aaron, visiting. Career-wise, where are you planning on taking... Because you're, you're only a year away now from graduation, you know. Yeah. Uh, well, a year, two years. A bit more than a year. Yeah, a bit more than a year. You've just started fifth year. So you've got this year and then you've got your internship year next year. Because obviously in, in Charles University, they have a jobs fair, which is attended by a lot of hospitals from the UK, you know. But where yeah, are yeah. you thinking about taking your career as a Hong Kong passport holder? Um, so right now, um, as to my future, I mm. actually plan to, because I, I studied, I, many of you don't know, I spent a lot of years studied in, in the UK previously before I joined this university. So, you know, I quite like the culture and the environment there. So maybe I will consider UK, but recently I also traveled to United States uh, mm. to complete part of my clinical obligatory rotation over there. So I actually just landed like a couple of weeks ago. Um, and it's also really, really eye-opening. The amount of stuff they allow you to do there is amazing. Um, so I will also consider, consider that. Con consider, like, considering where can I go is absolutely not a problem because, you know, the university is here, the education is provided. So it's really up to you where you want to go, where you're going to want to go in the, in the end. Uh, presumably, you know, if I want to spend more time in the future my, with my family, I, I will even consider go, going back to Hong Kong to work. Mm. Uh, the only thing that is setting me apart from that is literally that I have to take uh, that um, a Hong Kong medical licensing exam at the end, which mm. is practically the same as to everywhere I would like to study, yeah. even if you want to go to UK university, you have to take the same thing. Yeah, from the, well, from 2024, you'll have to take the MLA. You'll miss that if you want to come to the UK. You would, as a, as a Hong Kong citizen, you'd be sitting in the plab. If you had a British passport, then you wouldn't have to do that. But uh, we're exactly. all with that one, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, what we'll do is uh, there's someone, uh, Sangya, you've raised your hand. Now, I'll see if it lets me let you talk. If it doesn't, Sangya, I'm going to ask you to type your question in to the question and answer, but I'm going to see if it doesn't let me allow you to talk. Let's see. So, Sangya, you did raise your hand, and I've just been able to let you talk. So, if you want to ask a question, unmute and ask away. Hello. Can you Hello. guys hear me? Good to hear you. Hi. Hi. I'm Sangya. I'm speaking from Egypt, actually. So, I have an Indian passport, and I live in Egypt right now. Yeah. So my question was at Charles University, like 
how is the international student ratio? Like, I know that there's a lot of, um, like, obviously people from uh, the Czech Republic obviously study there as well. Yeah. But, like, how's the ratio of international students, like foreigners and Czech Republic people? Aaron, just I'll let you come in on that one in a second. Sangyu, when we're talking about the two the programs in the Czech Republic, on the English language program, mm -hmm. everyone is international. The Czech, the locals study on the Czech language program that is taught in Czech. Okay, none okay. of the Czech people... None of the Czech people is studying English? Very, very few. I've got one or two people with Czech passports who are studying on the English taught program. That's mainly because they've been living in the UK from a young age. The UK has historically been in the European Union since the 1970s, although we've left now. The, uh, so what you'll find is that there are people who've been living in the Czech Republic with Czech passports since they were children. And for many of them, they do go to uh, back to the Czech Republic to study. But the local students, they study in the local language because effectively it's free of charge for them. Yeah. But Aaron, if you can talk about then, because obviously I'm, I just deal with the students that we assist. What's the demographic of students in terms of nationalities in your cohort? Yeah. So in my cohort, I study in the uh, English parallel of the uh, first faculty in medicine. So practically everyone is in international, as Ben said. Um, according to the demographics of people, uh, most of the people are from actually. Uh, UK, Europe, uh, various countries, India, uh, Middle East. And I have to say, like, before I joined this university, or even now in my year, um, there aren't so many Asian students. Mm. Uh, most of the Taiwanese stu students or Japanese students are in new. Uh, they either go away uh, to study in another university or they dropped out, unfortunately. So yeah, mostly I'd say from the Euro. Yeah, yeah. And another question. So how many people are admitted to this program, the English program? Okay. How many it, spots are there? It varies from one university to the next time. You're looking at around about 140 on the medical program for Charles First faculty. For second faculty, it's about 90. For Hradec Kralovic, it's about 120. And then for, again, for Masaryk, it's about the same. For Palatsky, it's about 60 to 70. So, you know, it's it, there are so many programs that, and obviously, what you've got to bear in mind is someone who's applying to these faculties, they don't just apply to one, they apply to multiple. So they may have three or four offers. Yeah, but they can only obviously take one of those offers up themselves. So uh, the vast majority of students who apply and get an offer do enroll at one or more of the universities. Some are more popular than others. So first faculty is by far the most popular. I've very, very few students who've had an offer from first faculty turn it down. Usually they only turn it down if they get a place in their home country like the UK or personal circumstances change. Okay. All right, thank you. No problems. We've got someone else who's raised their hand at the moment and then we'll get down to the, the written questions. Okay. So, uh, Nimrit. Uh, hi. Actually, this is for my daughter that I'm asking. Uh, these okay. deposits that are required to be paid for, uh, uh, you know, if you get the offer, so now you just mentioned that some kids get offered for, from several universities. Yes. So does that mean uh, one has to pay that uh, uh, requisite deposit for? Oh, sorry, Nimrit. Uh, we had a bit of a mistake that happened on the thing there. Can you just raise your hand again? It seems to have disappeared. OK, we're back. Okay, you're permitted to talk again, Nimrit. Okay. We're back. Okay. Yes, can you hear me? Sorry about that. There was an error on the panelist list there. So yeah, you were talking about you were asking about the deposit, yeah? At what point is that expected okay. to be paid? Um, you, yeah. you don't have to worry about that actually, because if you're taking the exams in the block, which is the normal thing to do, what happens is you will receive your offers. And you'll have all of the offers in play before you have to make a decision. OK, so you wouldn't have to pay a deposit to a university prior to okay. finding out the offer from the other universities. Gotcha. Usually the deposit have to be paid two to three weeks after the offers being made. Palatsky University, it's a one and a half thousand euro deposit. OK, for example, Charles yeah. First Faculty doesn't require one. Okay. okay, so I wouldn't worry uh, too much about that. Okay, so basically one will have ample time a couple of weeks. You'll, you'll have ample time by which to process your thoughts around which offers you've received and then make a final decision about which program you will uh, enroll at. Okay, understood. 
Thank you. I'm just going to go through the written questions now, uh, everyone. I'm just going to remove people's hands that have uh, just give me one second to do this. Uh, it takes a little bit of a while. Okay, that means me and Aaron are back online. Okay, good. Right. Uh, there is a question from someone, Aaron, which is directed towards you. Okay. How did yeah. you find the transition learning check? How about your housing and your first year? Did you have a roommate and how did you find your roommate? So these are kind of the more the, the things. Firstly, transition to learning the Czech language. How have you found learning Czech? Let's take these one at a time. Right. So um, actually, if you stay in the city of Prague or in a city center area, uh, moving about uh, or maneuvering your way around the city center is, is, isn't a problem. Like using English um, isn't a problem at all. People understand you. You know, if you, if you go to a restaurant, order a, a, a set of meal, people understand you. Um, so regarding the live in Czech Republic, if you stay in the city center, it's not a problem uh, with Czech. However, in the uh, school or in the clinical environment, you are recommended to speak some commands of Czech. Um, and that, the language level, um, you'll gradually build up uh, throughout the years, gradually. And especially in first year, second year, they spend a lot of time with the new students practicing the language. And also at the end of the year, you also have to uh, pass a, a test uh, to prove your proficiency in the language as well. So, you know, it builds up bit by bit. Mm -hmm. And in the end, you'll be able to understand yeah. and, you know, but do you find like me, Aaron, that most students, they actually find things like anatomy harder than learning the local language, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. The one was about housing, Aaron. Did you, I think you, did you, did you stay in the student dorms or did you go straight into your own private apartment? Yeah, so what happens is if you apply to the universities in Czech Republic as, a, as an international student, they will, if you apply for the student housing dormitory, they will uh, prioritize you. Yeah, it's actually a requirement to have a document from the university guaranteeing you accommodation to apply for a visa anyway. They prioritize you. However, if you see, you know, living in the dormitory with a bunch of people around and you're not sure whether, you know, your study progress is going to be, you know, interrupted by, you know, all the noises and stuff going around, um, then you can live alone you can you can yeah. find uh, private housing from outside and there are plenty of agency doing that as well yeah. in first year i personally live alone uh, outside of the university uh, uh, dormitory and that's you know the aforementioned was exactly what i was thinking about I, I i didn't want anything to to block me from succeeding and passing first year and moving on yeah and that's how I did it. okay i didn't have right. a room we're going to go through the questions now, Aaron. A lot of these will be for me. Uh, there aren't too many, which is good, which will mean people can sign off on time in around about 15 minutes. Okay. Uh, first question was, do you need chemistry at the higher level, so this is IB, for all the universities in the UK? No, you don't necessarily. It varies from one to the other. Uh, some will, some don't. If you're looking at uh, some of the programmes, they do require chemistry at the higher level. Some will stipulate at least two sciences, which could be biology and physics. If you're applying for the non-UK programmes, it really doesn't actually matter what you've got at the higher level because admission is based on the entrance exam, but you will have to prepare for the entrance exams at a higher level uh, standard. Possibilities of internship and residency. That's going to depend on the countries that you're aiming to do your internship and residencies in, uh, Nimrit. So it's a bit difficult. You could remain in the Czech Republic if you wanted, provided there was a seat there for you. But most students would go to the UK or, or the US or Canada, for example. Someone's asked, once we graduate in, say, UK with a degree, can we practice medicine in your home country? I did talk about that on that section. The vast majority of countries around the world will recognize all of the programs that we've talked about today. There are some exceptions. If you're from Singapore, there can be exceptions there. Uh, and there can be some exceptions in India as well, as well as California. My advice is, depending on the country in which you want to go, and that's not been indicated in the question, do contact your medical council early. But if you want to work in the UK or across Europe, 
or across the US, Canada, Australia, Hong Kong, these programs are recognized. Also Japan as well, we've actually got quite a lot of graduates from the Czech Republic working back in Japan as well. Uh, the second slide, number of applications, are those applications both local and international or international only? Rosa, if you I will, sh this, this recording is going to be there. Uh, the, the big number at the bottom was total applications. Uh, international applications to the UK from non-EU was about 3,500 with about 1,700 for EU. So these were the numbers there. That data is also freely available on the UCAS website. You have to dig, dig for it a little bit and do a bit of searching, but it is there. Alternatively, do just take a look at the video uh, and I'll probably link to these PowerPoint slides as well from that video, which I'll upload onto the back end of the website uh, after this presentation. Amanda uh, from Dubai, who I've presented with before, uh, about US curriculum, APs and SATs. Yes, Amanda, I'll drop you an email directly because I have obviously got your email address. So I'll drop you a requirement for APs and SATs for the UK programs. For the US, it's not, uh, for the Czech programs, it's not as required uh, because obviously everything's based on the entrance exam should someone have completed the high school diploma. Is there a foundation program for Brunel if students have an American high school diploma? There is, and I'll send you details. Uh, but I can also send you the direct entry requirements as well, which are based on SATs and APs. Uh, Nimrit, was it, oh, this is for you, Aaron. Okay. Uh, are international students allowed to work? And if so, is it practically possible? We know the answer to this one. Uh, I know the answer to this one, but I'm going to let you answer it as a student. So um, regarding the opportunity to work, uh, first of all, your visa has to allow it. That's the first thing. And if, you, if your visa allows you to work here, and it really depends on where you come from as well, and the mm. visa status. So I can't really, uh, you know, answer the question for you all. But coming from Hong Kong, for example, um, the, uh, the working opportunity is um, you can't you can't work in the Czech Republic. There are other reasons. There are other reasons I don't think why it's feasible. Firstly, the, the volume of work you're going to have on the medical course is going to make it practically impossible for you to spend any significant amount of time wor working to earn money. Also, the, when we talk about the tuition fees being so much cheaper in the Czech Republic, there's a reason for that because the overheads and the salaries that people get paid are lower than say they would be in the US, Hong Kong, or in the UK. So the amount of money that you would earn in a service industry based job is going to be so much smaller than it would be if you were doing a comparative job in, in, in the UK. Uh, so I, I would say it's not really viable or financially really viable for doing that compared to spending 10 hours studying for your, uh, for your, uh, your studies. Okay. Uh, now, what Okay, there's a, there's a couple of other questions I want to get to, Aaron, but there's another one for you before we kind of... Oh, that's disappeared now. Okay, uh, the question's just disappeared, so it doesn't worry, but we'll, uh, we'll go over that one. I'm from Hong Kong and I have a British passport holder. Would I need a visa to study in Prague? For 2021, Grace, you do. I'm already in communication with the Czech embassy in London for the British applicants who are living in the UK. But if you're in Hong Kong and have a British passport, you will need a visa to study in Prague from September of 2021. Uh, I can provide more information on that and we will need some UK documents as well. OK, uh, someone has asked for the AP info. Aaron, this is another Aaron. Aaron Jones, can you drop me an email? It will be easy if I just reply to your email. I will take a note of your email address now and get yeah, the information sure. as well. That's a different Aaron, yeah. not you. Uh, Should I send it to you? I send, you, send it to your text message. Oh, this is it, Aaron. It's not you. It's a different Aaron who's sending me a message. Okay. okay. So don't worry about that. Uh, I think that was going to cause some confusion. Uh, right. Someone's asked, will my parents be given a visa and allowed to come with me to travel? So yes, you, as a student, you would require a long stay student visa, but parents can come along and they'll come along on a simple short stay Schengen visa. Basically, if you go to the Czech consulate or the Czech embassy in the country you're applying for your student visa from, your parents can basically apply for a short stay visa on the basis that you are going there as a student to enroll. That will make it particularly easy because that, that, that visa application doesn't have to go through the Ministry of Interior in Prague like a student visa does. It can be issued directly by the consulate as well in, in the country in which you're applying. 
Okay. So by the looks of that, that's all the questions. Oh, someone's got one more. Any particular things? Uh, US passport holders. So US passport holders living in Hong Kong need to bear in mind regard to visas and other legal requirements. Right, I will talk about this now for those living in Hong Kong. The, the, the Czech consulate in Hong Kong are very, very helpful, as Aaron will testify, because he had to go there to apply for his Czech visa. Okay, they are very, very helpful. Based on mine, it's a small consulate. Hong Kong is a, like a, a niche city state. So it is, they are very useful, they are very uh, helpful compared to a larger embassy in a larger country. Okay. Uh, what I will say is that if you're in Hong Kong and you've not got a Hong Kong passport, we need to prepare your paperwork a bit earlier because one of the requirements for getting a visa for the Czech Republic is you have a police report from the country in which you've been living in, but also a police report from the country from which your passport is issued. So Aaron only needed a Hong Kong passport, but if you were a student perhaps with an Indian passport or a British passport or a US passport, you will also need a police report issued from the country that your passport is issued from as well. So you would need two potential uh, passport, uh, police reports. That does complicate things, okay? Uh, will there be any changes in applying or joining because of COVID? That's the elephant in the room, okay. So Aaron would have had, a, Aaron had a lot of his education online last year, uh, well, from the beginning of this year, okay which has obviously meant that uh, there, was, there were changes. This last year, all of our entrance exams were held online because we couldn't physically do them in person. At the moment in time, the Czech Republic have moved to a lot of lead lectures online because of COVID, but they are moving back gradually to face-to-face -face contact in small groups of groups that can't change because of, of that, okay? Uh, are there any, that's basically that really. So it's going to be a question of watch this space over the next 12 months to see how things progress. Someone wants the SAT and AP requirements. Uh, can you please email me at Ben at Medical Doorway if you want those requirements because I need to spe specifically send them only for the universities that you're applying for because they are different. Nimrit has asked, so I would need a police report from the US even if you've not lived there. Yes. It sounds crazy, but you would still need a police report and you can get it from the US consulate in Hong Kong. Okay, that huge building on the way back down from Victoria Peak. So uh, even if you're an Indian citizen and you're living in Hong Kong and haven't lived in India, at this moment in time, the Ministry of the Interior will want to see a police report from the country of your nationality, plus the one that you've lived in. I will provide advice in the run-up to the Hong Kong exams should you be taking those exams so you can start to prepare those documents in advance. Okay. Hikari, if you Hikari, you can send me that email, please, to Ben at Medical Doorway or hello at medicaldoorway.com. I will send it to you specifically. It's uh, just easier than trying to take down all the notes from here. Okay. Right. Uh, there are no more questions. We have been going on now for coming up to an hour and a half. Okay. I want to say a huge thank you to everyone who's joined us. We had a huge number of people who came online at its peak, actually, and thank you for that. This uh, is going to be go be published on our uh, YouTube channel. Fingers crossed later today it will go on there once I've done a few edits and things. Okay, so it will be on there for anyone. Ooh, we've got more questions coming in, Aaron. But what I want to do before I answer these questions is say a huge thanks to Aaron who's taken time out of his day. He's been in the clinical years, uh, and uh, it's been a big, big help having Aaron there. So parents and, and students get to see someone who's actually done it really, rather than me who's sitting here trying to advise people. Okay. Good to help out. Yeah. Uh, someone, Grace has asked, I will be having my A-level exams in May and June, 2021. How would I sit the entrance exams if I have my A-levels between the six days? We have different exam dates available, Grace, not just those Hong Kong ones. Uh, do have a look for the other ones. We'll, we'll, and we can take a look at the exams and figure out when they fall. And it may be that you can take some of the exams, but not others. Uh, so do I need to be over 18 to apply for a police report? No, from, from once you're over 15, I believe most countries allow you to get a police report. Uh, so that wouldn't be a problem. Uh, they are used to producing police reports for under 18s. This is something I even had to deal with when I was dealing with students in UK universities who are applying from Hong Kong. So you, know, you will be able to apply for a police report, even if you're under 18, okay? So finally, Aaron, 
huge thank you uh, for this. I know it's a it's a it's a, a busy period in the Czech Republic with COVID and working in the hospitals like you are at the moment and giving up your time both voluntarily as well to help me and the students out. So a huge thank you. And it's a fortunate I couldn't meet you in Hong in Prague this time, but perhaps I'll be out in Prague again before too long and get the chance to catch up in person. Uh, and again, a massive thank you. Please enjoy the rest of your day. But I know you'll be going straight back to studying anyway. Okay. Okay. Thank you, so much. Thank you. you can sign off if you want, Aaron, now, and I'll just uh, sign off for everyone else. Okay. So Grace has said thank you as well, Aaron. So uh, that's great. Okay. Anyway, thank you everyone for tuning in and uh, listening to what we had to say. This will be going on YouTube later today. So if you want to kind of catch up on this presentation tomorrow, uh, that you can do. Thanks again. If you've got any questions, ben at medicaldoorway.com or hello at medicaldoorway.com or go onto the website and fill in one of the inquiry forms. The dates for the exams are being finalized. They'll be published towards the end of this week for Hong Kong and the UK dates as well. Until next time, if I hear from you, I'll get straight back to an email. But have a great, uh, great evening in Hong Kong or wherever you are and stay safe. Bye for now.